Kim, good to see you. Would you take us from here, please? Certainly, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me start by saying it is very nice to be back with you. Um, as many of you know, I had a heart attack about a month ago. And oh, my. It was, uh, oh, there we go. Um, it was an unusual experience, um, needless to say, but I feel fine. Um, good enough to go get a haircut yesterday to be with you you know the hair had gotten a little bit longer and, and uh, with all that stuff so but it's uh, it's very good to be with you and, and be back before you on this side um i'm going to talk about a subject that has gotten a lot of publicity um uh, up here um as well as elsewhere around the country uh, and that is what people have called prison gerrymandering um, so um, today's discussion, um, I'm going to end up hitting a number of different points. Um, I want to take a little bit of time to look at the history of the issue nationwide. Um, I want to look at some of the court cases in the last decade. I want to look at some of the practices that, that has happened here in Rhode Island. Um, and then I will, will tell you about some workings that we've had with ACI, the correction facility, and working and getting some of their data. And we've done a lot of things in terms of investigating uh, the data from them. And I'm going to tell you about that. Um, uh, looking at the population in, in the prison versus the prison counts, we've taken a close look at that. We have looked at and received um, information from the ACI that allows us to geocode the information to see where the addresses are from the prisoners and all of that and some evaluation of what we've done on that front. Um, and then um, we'll turn it over back to you to look at what's ahead on that side. So. From standpoint of nationwide, um, I have uh, distributed to, to all the commissioners as well as to the public, I believe, um, the National Conference of State Legislatures, who I have a lot of dealings with and have done a, trainings for them and, and lots of different things. Um, they are a excellent site for uh, providing information on what's going on around the country. Um, they have, as I believe all of you already have, uh, the red book, um, the legal book that they put together on redistricting. Um, I was one of the editors of that book and um, have done a lot of things with them over the decade, uh, multiple decades in terms of that. So uh, I'm always interested in, in what they have and they've done a good job in looking at what is taking place around the country and so i wanted to provide that to you so that you have that information on that side in before 2010 there was really not a lot of discussion on this issue um, there was an effort um, and it came about really out of the state of new york um, where there was an, a, an attempt, and it came from the Democratic side of the aisle, who felt that they were being shortchanged by looking at what was happening in New York State, where prisoners were being shipped upstate, uh, away from New York City. And so some okay. of the feeling was that if we could bring them back into the city, that would help us in terms of, of the political balance that was happening in New York. Um, that started off the process. It has taken on and moved well past that, but that was one of the first things that people looked at in, in terms of this. It was clearly the case that prisons are up in other parts of, the, of a state, uh, away from the population. Um, Usually people don't want to have a prison right next to them, obviously. Um, and so it, it was um, par for the course that in a lot of instances they were away from urban areas and um, with minorities occupying 
a larger share of some of the prison populations that had an impact uh, around the country. So in 2010, there were three states that adopted, Delaware, Maryland, and New York, adopted the process to attempt to take the population of the prisons and reallocate them, find out what addresses they're at, and try to redistribute them around the state. Um, I've talked with uh, people involved in each of those states to talk about how they went about doing it. Um, how successful was it? What kind of experiences did they have? Um, and there was a lot of discussion that went on to see was it, was it easy, was it difficult? Um, the biggest problem that most of the states have um, is that it was difficult to get a, an idea of who was in prison on April 1st of 2020, uh, in this decade for 2020. Um, and so there was a lot of efforts in a number of states to try to see how could we make sure that we get data that will be comparable to the census. April 1st of the year ending in zero is when census day takes place. And that's certainly what you want to try to figure out um, who was in prison on that day because that's where the Census Bureau will be counting the people on that day in the prison given their uh, procedures that they have put in place for a number of decades. So in order to see if it's possible to reallocate the population, you got to figure out who was there on Census Day. Um, and in a number of states, that became difficult. Um, states have continued to talk about some of that difficulty of that. Some states have gotten their act together in, in a better sense of having information. Uh, but a lot of states do not. Um, and so it becomes an issue if you're trying to institute this kind of a policy of redistributing people back to their homes. Um, what we heard from the states is that it's not only um, difficulty to get data corresponding with Census Day, but it's also difficult to get addresses on where people would be going to if when they get released. And so it's a question that has come and plagued a number of states in how best and what, do, what kind of addresses can we get. When a, when a person is taken into prison, um, we've had uh, here with ACI and talking with them, um, they raise the question themselves is, we don't know how good this address is or these addresses. And so it is a problem that other states have had and that we saw here in Rhode Island on that side. Kim, let me ask you for a minute that, that on that point. What have you seen the other states do? We don't have to amplify it at great length, but I'm curious. What have, what have other states done in that respect when you don't have a, uh, an address that may necessarily be valid? What has the, been the consensus? Um, the, uh, there's actually been a variety of practices put into place. Um, and I'll talk about some of that in terms of the, the geocoding process that goes on. Um, but it is an, an issue that you, you have to plan ahead of time to deal with that issue. Um, and that's what a number of states have, have mentioned to me uh, of trying to get things ahead of time. And part of what some of the states have been looking at is getting, if you're going to look at a policy such as this, is getting advanced work ahead of time. You want to work with the corrections facilities. You want to make them aware of this kind of a policy and the potential so that they could start collecting the data that you're going to need. They don't always have that. And that's part of the problem that some of these states 
have experienced and seen. Um, we, we do a lot of work in the state of Illinois. Illinois is one of those that have adopted uh, the practice to do um, dealing with prisoners. But they put in place, they passed the law in 2020, but they put in place that it's not going to take effect until 2025, and it'll be put in use in 2030. Because they started to see and recognize the wide variety of potential issues that you have. And that is what these three states would tell you um, if you went and talked to them. Um, the NCSL has done a number of different workshops on this issue. Um, I've been to just about all of them. Um, and we've had each of the people from each of these states come to talk to legislators and staff of some of their experiences. But that's the problem that you have, is having stuff ahead of time and being able to work with the corrections facilities to get the right kind of data that you're going to need. Because they don't always see that on that side. So in 2020, um, and looking at uh, this, this decade, California put in place in 2012 uh, their efforts to try to do prison gerrymandering. Um, and a number of other states have implemented the process for looking at this and doing it for 2020. Um, I've talked to some of them. They're running into the same kind of issues. Some of them have been able to answer that. Some of them have not. Some of them didn't start ahead of time like, you know, other states would have told them to do. Um, so they're all kind of getting a grasp of this issue. But it is something... Ken, let me interrupt you for one sec. Uh, Rep. Corvasi. Yes. Excuse me. Um, when you're talking about the information from the other states, um, we don't have a federal prison here. We have Wyatt, but we don't have a federal prison. Was the calculations in the other states that have federal prisons, were they also included as, uh, as the state prisons were? Or were federal prisons excluded? It depends on the state. Some states included them and some states did not. That table that we put together for you from NCSL has a column for state prisoners and federal prisoners. So you can see that there is a variety of how people have looked at this issue. It is a valid question and a valid issue of how you can look at this. You all set, yep. Rep. Covesi? Yep. Was there another question? Senator Sosnowski or no, Senator no, Fuller? Oh, ah, okay. certainly. Thank you. We'll get Senator Sosnowski at the table. Go ahead, Kim. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, so, um, we've got a lot more that are working on this issue and experimenting with this issue. Um, we've been involved in, in some of the stuff down in Virginia and looking what they've done. Uh, I've talked to the staff down there. They're grappling with this same sort of thing. Um, they're not getting everybody that they've gotten from the prison to be able to geocode. They haven't been able to place them in a home address. Uh, Virginia reports that they were only getting like 62% of the prisoners being able to, to get to a different address on that side. Um, so it varies and NCSL is doing an effort to try to collect numbers on this, not just statutes but actually the numbers of what people are reporting and being able to use. Um, and we're going to be providing them with some of the stuff that we've seen in Rhode Island on that side. So um, there is a variety of issues that are... Excuse me, Kim. Different. Senator Felag. So yes. basically what you're saying is that those states that pass this type of law uh, passed it through the General Assembly, 
correct? In most instances, yes, it was a statute. Um, we do know that, of course, in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, their commission has attempted to adopt, but that is being challenged now in court. Um, but in most instances, it is a statute that came into play. And, and with that statute, you can establish whatever guidelines you want. In other words, you're, you're saying that it's a, uh, a point in time, April of 2020, you would have to find out who was in prison, and then you would have to say those prisoners where they were last known address was if it was in rhode island then obviously you could move it to a, a city or town in rhode island but if they were out of state do you count them at that facility or do you, you just exclude them altogether depends on how you want to write the law okay <laughs> all right yeah i mean you know, these are all things yes, that, that they that, are that have valid to be questions consi on that considered side. and then i guess if someone was incarcerated for life does he become the resident of that uh, facility? Right. Because length of time in a prison is, is one dicta of what can we implement? What can we do um, on that side? Um, and so that's what we've started to take a look at. Also. So those are all guidelines you can establish as to the, the length of time, whether or not that person really does live somewhere else. And I guess the only thing you can go by is what, their last known address was prior to what, you can't, what they have said their last home okay. address is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. yeah. Senator Metz. Yes, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Um, I, I, I don't see what's so hard about looking at the zip codes from where someone comes from to figure out what uh, area they're from. And regardless of someone is in prison or not, poor people move a lot within the same neighborhood. Neighborhood, right. Depending on, it, depending on whether they can pay the rent or not, if they got evicted. But they're pretty much going to stay in the same neighborhood. So uh, then Rhode Island being a small state, you have a, we had the one prison in Cranston. But guess where, guess where all the resources are when they get out? They got to go to the Amos house to eat, five blocks from my house. Yep. They got to go to Crossroads, and all that is in Senate District 6. So we know pretty much in, here in Providence, in Rhode Island, where the people come from and where they're going to go, because no one else wants them. So they, put well, every, so they put everything over on the south side for the, for I, the most I part. I have some information for you. Good, good, because I'd, I'd, lo I'd love to see it. Yep. But so, I'm, I'm, so I don't understand why it's so hard to, to kind of, there's a lot of factors that have to be taken into account. And certainly uh, uh, poverty and, and whatnot is, is, a, is a big thing. But we know yes. where the people, are, where, where they come from. And we know where they're going to go when they get out. They're going to go where they can get something to eat and, and, and hopefully a shelter where they can stay someplace warm at night. But I just, I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you, mm -hmm. Mr. Co-Chair. Certainly. Senator Quesada. Thank you, uh, Chair. My question is how hard it is to get uh, a count because they know how many inmates they have, then how they cannot give, uh, provide that data. We've been working on that, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Okay, um, I do have a, a lot of data to help out on that side. So let me continue on and we can get to some of some of those questions too. But there's a variety of issues that are treated differently in different states on that side. Um, the question of state inmates versus federal inmates, uh, in-state residents versus out-of-state residents, where do we count those? <clears throat> the ability to geocode, as I've mentioned. Um, do you have addresses in prison records? And the reliability of those addresses is an issue. How do you handle questionable addresses? Do you place it at the centroid of the city, if that's all that they've said? Do you place it at the centroid of a census tract? or the centroid of a zip code, uh, as Senator Metz has said? 
you know, that is a policy decision for you to take a look at in how best to deal with that. Some states have excluded the data. If we can't get an address that allows us to place somebody physically at a particular census block, then that starts raising questions in terms of that. The Census Bureau attempts to place people in a certain census block. And so that's what we're always looking at in terms of trying to geocode the information to get it to be comparable to where we are on the census. Rep Newberry. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to address one point Senator Metz brought up. I agree with you fundamentally on this issue, but I don't think you can do zip codes because I don't know about other towns, but my town, we have five zip codes. Two of them are actually post offices in other towns. Like if you took the zip code, you wouldn't have an accurate, necessarily an accurate count of where people are. I don't know if there's any perfect system, but if we're going to do this, it's got to be done based on address. It can't be based on zip code, in my opinion. And I do agree with you. We should do something. So you're just seeing some of the issues that there are uh, with this issue on that side. Um, as I mentioned, I've been involved in a couple of court cases on the prisoner issue. Um, in two recent cases I've been involved with, one is in the state of Connecticut, um, where I was the expert witness on the state's behalf. And we were looking at the data um, that the state had collected. We worked with the attorney general's office. They had actually done a lot of work with the prisons to be able to get data. And so we had access to a lot of good data in Connecticut's instance. Um, but one of the intriguing things that the, the attorneys had the, um, the corrections facility do is look at where people go back to, because that's the issue in many instances. Do they go back to their home addresses? And what Connecticut found is that 60% plus of inmates did not return to the home of record after the release. Now, some of them went to, as Senator Metz said, to way houses and that sort of stuff. But it does raise a question in terms of the discussion of sending them back to their home because that's where they would go. We don't know that's for true yet. We don't know if that's the case. We don't know if that's the case in Rhode Island because we don't have the data on that side. But Connecticut, that is what they found in looking at their records back in probably five years ago. In the city of Cranston, I was also involved in their court case down there, dealing with the challenges to the ward redistricting and the city's decision to put the ACI population all in a single ward. Um, and as a result, it made it a larger share of that particular district. Uh, and that became an issue in the case. Um, the lower court decision went against the city, but it was overturned on the appeals court standpoint. And it dealt with the question of how the Evanwall Supreme Court case provided the latitude to local governments to make the kind of decisions on what to do with the prisons. And so it's a, an issue that is there um, is still relevant on that side. And there's been other court cases also. But it is something that is important to take a look at and look at it legally in terms of, of this information. And it is an emerging area of the law. Um, certainly from the standpoint, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Pennsylvania uh, the, the commission there, redistricting commission, just in the last several months made the decision to have uh, prisoners re, um, reallocated. Um, that is now in a court of law. And so we don't know how that's going to resolve. 
it's a little bit different circumstance than you here in your commission in Rhode Island compared to Pennsylvania, but it is something that is an emerging area of the law to keep in mind. So, <clears throat> let me take a look at what's the history of dealing with prison prisoners here in Rhode Island as it relates to the census data. In 19, as many of you know, I've been here forever. Um, <laughs> I've, I've been doing this in your state for a long time. Um, in 1990, um, all of the ACI was in a single house district, okay? Um, house District 25. Um, there were 3,681 people in the ACI in the 2000 population, okay? We don't have the 1990 population. But by 2000, that amounted to 40% of the district a large percent on that side. On the Senate side, the Senate ended up dividing the ACI between two different districts, Senate District 12 and Senate District 14, and as a result, it brought down the percent of what that ACI contributes to a district. So, when we hit 2000, we had testimony in the commission that was in existence then. We had testimony that it was best to divide the ACI for the house districts into multiple districts. And so that's what we attempted to do. We ended up splitting apart the ACI so that it was not contributing a large percentage to any one particular district. That was what was desired by the activists that came to testify. And so we answered that question and how we drew those districts. As you can see, the percentages were all kept down. On the Senate side, it was all in Senate District 27, but Senate districts are twice the size and it was only 12% of the district. So we attempted to handle some of the issue on that side in 2000. When we looked towards 2010, last decade, we again divided the ACI between two House districts and between two Senate districts. And here's the percentages of what of the district the ACI contributed to that district. Anywhere from 9% to 17%, in the House, 10% and 2% in the Senate. So it was a way to make sure that we were not putting all the eggs in one basket on that side. When we look towards 2020, first off, there's a couple of key factors that come into play. One of those is what I'm highlighting here and I'm gonna show more of, of is that we lost about 1,100 people in ACI over the last decade. That has a significant change in how things are. So that right now, if we look at the 2020 census data in what percent of each of the districts are made up by the ACI, you see that we're dealing with smaller percentages also two House districts, 15 and 20, and two Senate districts, 27 and 31. So that we do have smaller percentages already <clears throat> in how we're dealing with this. <clears throat> Here's an aerial overlay, or an aerial picture of ACI. And the various major pieces of ACI with minimum security and maximum security areas and women and the state hospital, high, society, high security area, uh, the intake center. These numbers that are on the screen here are all the data from 2010 
census, okay? So you can end up seeing. What we ended up seeing on this in 2010 is that we had a bunch of strange geographies to deal with. And so we set about, in looking towards 2020, of trying to get a better handle on the geography and what was being reported in the, in the ACI. And so what we ended up doing in 2020 is we attempted to clean up the census blocks. Excuse me, Kim. Jim and Phillips, if you uh, can go back to the last slide, please, Kim. Uh-huh. I'm just trying to, again, this, this is new to me, new to a lot of people, even in the audience, it's new to us. So can you expound on how they handle or how other states are handling the people in the intake center? Because they're not convicted and in the ACI itself. Are they already back out at their home address and we've already pulled them out? Or is it a different way of calculating? Um, different states are doing it differently. The intake center depends on how long they're being kept there. Um, we're trying to get that information from ACI. We, we don't have an answer yet on that. But it is something that we can, working with ACI, at least seeing how many people are in each of these census blocks. And I'm going to show you the new data from them and looking at this. Kim, let me just uh, amplify on that for one second, that question. Does it follow then that some people at intake center, irrespective of the number, may actually be counted as being at the intake center rather than their home address? Um, yes, that's possible, sure. Um, the lion's share is certainly to... coming into it. If I don't mean to, the lion's share of people coming in clearly are still residents of where they are, and the intake center, just so everyone knows, that's where you go initially when you're being held before sentencing or moved to another facility, medium or what have you, minimum, maximum. S some people at, at intake then are counted as being at intake? Well, from the, from the ACI standpoint, on April 1 they're in the intake center, okay? Now the question is, is what happens with the census? And what kind of data is reported to the census to be able to see that kind of information? The, the ACI is, from the census terminology, is known as a group quarter. And that is a special way of counting people. It's not always the instance where you go and hand out a survey, the census survey, and get people to fill it out, collect it, take it back, have it processed, like we do with most people in single family homes. Um, in group quarter situations, they have different procedures. Um, not only is correction facilities a group quarter, but college dorms are a group quarter. Military bases are a group quarter. All of those kind of things have different ways the census goes about to collect the information from those areas or those uh, groupings. Um, and in a lot of instances, um, particularly like for college dorms, um, they'll go and collect the registrar's information on the college and who's in McDowell Hall or Letts Hall or whatever, and that's what they'll use to count for that particular census block. Kim, I just have to say I was an RA in McDowell Hall. That's American University. That one's warm to my heart. I, I, I won't interrupt in you anymore, Hall, but that's your chairman. That's, I that's good American stuff. University. Yeah. That's good stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. That's why I raised the issue. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Rep Uchi, thank you. Uh, Kim, just a quick question. So when, when the surveys go out to uh, college, do they have the same instructions as when they go to a prison, or is it all treated the same as far as the questions, or are they different depending on what it is? Um, they are all the same question there, okay? Um, and in most instances, group quarters are handled the same kind of way. Um, they'll provide um, forms if they want 
but they'll try to collect information of what has already been collected by the entity, by the correction facility, by the college, by the military base, all of that sort of thing. Depends on what they have, but that's why census enumerators go out ahead of time to work with the various group quarter entities to say, what have you got? You know, what can you provide us? How is it? Is it good? Is it, you know, what, what can we have access to on that side? So that's how the Census Bureau tries to deal with a group quarter situation as opposed to a household. And then a follow-up. So we also have the, the Wyatt Detention Center in, how was that a group quarter or is that different or was that? <clears throat> that was a group quarter. Um, we know how many people uh, are there. <clears throat> there is only one census block for Wyatt. Mm -hmm. It's not like there's multiple buildings there. So it's one census, one, one census block in that regard. Thank you. <clears throat> so from the standpoint of ACI, this is kind of the dimension that we have. But as I said, in 2020, we started looking closely because we wanted to try to get more census blocks within the ACI <clears throat> so that we had more data for more area, more pieces of geography. One of the things that we did is attempt to clean up some of the geography that the Census Bureau had. Um, we put down here, if you can see, um, this is a census block now that backs up to the ACI. But in 2010, the, the geography of the ACI came down and cut into these houses here. And these houses were, in essence, counted as part of the prison. So then, Kim, does it follow that now, and a decade later, no houses are counted in the ACI block other than the ACI? That's right. Okay. From what, what we did in terms of trying to get the geography correct and trying to get some more information and more demarcations of different areas. And so we were very cognizant of trying to get all the different buildings identified as a separate census block so that we could get more counts of the information. So you can see the yellow lines of what was done before, but the red lines are where more census blocks were created and being able to bifurcate this area from that area, for example. All of this was an attempt to try to figure out and get a better numbers and better pieces of geography to work with within the ACI. So we have been working with ACI. We ended up entering into a non-disclosure agreement with them to be able to access and be given a copy of their prison records. Um, I will go to my grave by not giving you that. You're not gonna see it. Um, we have it, we have it for the purposes of analyzing it and looking at the information, but we're not gonna provide it to anybody on that side. Um, our agreement with ACI is to make sure that the confidentiality of what is there in their records retains there. And so that's what we have agreed in a non-disclosure agreement. We have been given and gotten information from ACI, as I said, as of April 1st, 2020, on all the inmates that were there. We do have the names, we do have the addresses, we do have the ages, the date of birth, the race of the individual, and what facility they were placed in. 
This is all information that you're not going to see. We've used it to try to get some handles and some counts on things, on where people might be sent to and where might people might go to on that side. But it's, it's all for the purposes of trying to get aggregate numbers in order to take a look at this information on that side. What we don't know... Excuse me, Kim. Rep. Yes. Lovese. Yes, Rep. Uh, no, I, uh, I'm, I, what you're about to say, I believe, what, what you're about to talk about is what I'm interested in. Go ahead. I just saw you pop up the next parrot. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, I do that to you all the time, Rep. I'm sorry about that. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, we don't know the length of the sentence that each of the prisoners have. Um, we're trying to go back to ACI to maybe get some of that information to let us get a feel for uh, length of, of sentences because that may be something that may be relevant to you. Um, Kim, just, uh, you know, yes. in, a, in, in almost a lay sense, but as a, as a man who spends his career dealing with prosecuting people and defending people, all I deal with five days a week is criminal cases. I really don't know how you could get a handle on length of sentence because where some sentences do have a defined length of time, many other sentences are interrupted or cut short for a host of reasons, from violations and new charges to reductions in time. And uh, I just don't, I was thinking to ask you about length of sentence, and then I thought, how do you get your, hand, your hands wrapped around that, you know? I don't know that you could. Um, that may be what we come back with from talking with ACI people. Um, indeed, it, it is a legitimate question. Um, it is a question of, you know, how could conceivably the legislature structure something to maybe do something based upon how long somebody is there or expected to be there or that sort of thing? I mean, that may be some avenue that may be possible. But again, it depends on, you know, what kind of data do we have? And so that's what we're going to try to explore to help that kind of question. Um, you know, we want to find out who is Excuse still me, there. Kim. Rep. Corvese. Yep. So just let's dig into this a little bit. The census is essentially a snapshot in time. There are certain parameters that... Um, are determined by the census at that time. An address is determined at that time. We don't know if someone who's living in a single family house six months after the census is going to be somewhere else. So, and I'm only speaking for myself, no one else, not the committee or anyone. A person in a single family house may not be at that address in six months inmate at the ACI may be at a different address than the one he came in with or she came in with. Right. So I think that if, if anything is going to be modified or changed, that we, we have to at least set some set of parameters. Myself, it would be the address where the individual came from. It's the address where the individual came from, not the zip code. I agree with my colleague. Uh, uh, Rep. Uh, Rep. Um, Newberry, that uh, a zip code can have more than one uh, rep district. A zip code can have more than one senate district. Yes. We have correct. essentially two, essentially two zip codes in North Providence. We have five senators. Right. Which I, which I won't comment on. <laughs> but. <laughs> um, but it's one of them right here. That's right. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think yeah. with, 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 with all due respect to Senator Metz, who I have a great deal of respect for, they talk about zip codes. I think what would be important would be the actual address. So that's one factor. The other factor I'm interested in, and, and, and I realize I'll defer to uh, co-chair uh, Ashimbo, who has the experience as a lawyer, I think the sentences, the length of time left on the recorded sentence at the time of the census may play a part. 
if someone has more than 10 years left on a sentence at the time of the census, that individual's residence is Cranston. That's it. Right. Now, five years or more, five years or less, however the committee deems appropriate is another story. That's up to discussion. And I'm sure we're going to hear uh, opinions on that from the public, which is important. But I, I think that if, and I knew you have the non-disclosure agreement, I think that type of information is important to you, uh, depending on the direction this committee goes. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Rev. There's a lot of wisdom in what you said. Uh, Mr. Rays, that's a question, Kim. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, and Kim, and I appreciate uh, Rep. Corvese's questioning on the sentence and the, and the length of sentence because it does make a difference. What about those on probation? Now, that's not even a, you know, you could be on probation for 20 years. How would that constitute uh, someone living at, in a residence uh, in Providence? And they've been on probation for 20 years. Would they still be considered an inmate? Because they are technically still serving a sentence. Um, but I guess the question would be is what's the address? You know, yeah, let, let me jump in for a second. Of physically, can we place them someplace? Yeah, let me, let me just help a little bit with that. If you're incarcerated, if you get a sentence, let's just use a, a, a framework for a district court, for example. You, get a, you have no criminal record. You come in, you get a filing. It's not a conviction. Your case stays on a shelf for a year, gets uh, expunged at the end of the year. Next step up will be probation. Still not a conviction. One year in district court, the end takes you five years to get it off your record. The next step up is a conviction, suspended sentence, where they actually say ACI for whatever period of time, sentence suspended, and typically probation runs with it. And then beyond that is you're just going straight to the ACI, nothing suspended. I think we're talking about residences where you have sentences that are, you've got a conviction. You're actually at the ACI. If it were straight probation, that wouldn't be the case. So if you've got straight probation, you're not going to the ACI. No, I understand that, yep. Chair. But, but those there's some sentences where you are serving, let's say, three years and you have 10 years probation how would that play a part in it knowing that you're already in that gap period of the 10 years of redistricting you know now that person's been out for seven years on probation would they still be considered a, a, a part of the uh, uh, Cranston you know population because they served only three years or a year or two within that 10 year gap now that's a great question I, I'm not yeah. sure the answer to that at all so that's a great question. Thank Good you. Good question. Yeah, Mr. absolutely. Chairman. Yes, Thank Rep. Uchi. So, again, my time of doing what you did goes back two decades, but it's um, we also have to keep in mind folks who are in there on a child support hold, folks who are on bail, who just can't make bail or are held without bail and have no charge. How long are they? I mean, these are the other buckets that right. we have to think about of people who have, no, have not been convicted. In, in who are there so that's yeah that'd be interesting as you go through this to ha you know have these buckets yeah so. absolutely thank okay. you so um so we don't know a number of things um who is still there um were they felons or just misdemeanors we don't have that information on the records yet um we don't really know the address that they would return to we have an address of what they said when they came in, but we don't know if somebody is keeping an address, like a parole board or something like that, of where they went. As I said, state of Connecticut did have that information, and that was really useful to understand some of this dimension. And whether or not um, prisoners can register or to vote on that side. Um, you know, um, the Cranston does have some um, prisoner, uh, some people at some of the addresses in the prison on the registration list on that side. So, you know, that's one factor. But there is still some un unknowns at this point in time. So, this is some of what we have. If we look at the various places within the ACI, um, 
I'm hoping you guys can see and Kim I was going to say I personally have zero shot of I seeing that see I that, see yeah. green and some writing <laughs> anybody who can see that <laughs> he know, can't even I see know. the TV I, if you would amplify on it for us please <laughs> um, the, the, these PowerPoints will be up online so you'll be able to go into the into the data and take a look at it um, I'll give you a broad overview on what you will see and I would encourage you to take a look at it. Thank you. Um, we have the various facilities within on the left-hand side. So the median security, the intake center, the maximum security, minimum security, high security, the Eleanor State Hospital, the Women's Hospital, um, Harrington Hall for homeless uh, sex offenders, the Eleanor State Hospital. Um, there's a juvenile facility. There are a number of places. And then we still have three places that have been closed since 2010. The median security price uh, uh, record, the Dorothea Dix um, facility, and the uh, RIDOC Training Academy was there in 2010, but is n not in use anymore. So what we did is this left-hand column is the population from the census. And we now know because we have identified the individual blocks individually, as opposed to a collection of blocks, we know how many people are in each of these different facilities. And that's the column of the total population 2020. And what census block now in 2020 they are at. And the kind of the type of the use of the institutional facility, um, correction facilities for adults, for juveniles, all of that kind of information we have obtained from ACI. <clears throat> because we have the data not only for 2020, but we have for 2020. 10, we can take a look at the populations in each of these facilities in 2010, and that's the next column of data. And then we can look at the change. If you remember, I mentioned to you there's a thousand less people in the ACI this decade than last decade. Um, it is spread in a number of different instances, as one can see in this. The biggest decrease is that closing of the median security. The price, um, 310 people um, were there in 2010 and is not there at all in 2020. Uh, but we're seeing uh, minimum security is down 255 people and the intake center is down 202 people. So all of those are are different excuse me Kim Ms. Bucci. I, I can't see the screen could we have the total number on the intake center on the intake center it um, right now there's 706 people in the census in 2010 there was 908 so that's a drop of 202 people in the intake center okay right. Rep Kazarian uh, and just to be clear, when um, they take somebody into the intake center, they are collecting their address, correct? Their their last known address. Yes. What, what you were, I just want to clarify the point that you made. What you said was that they're not, um, they're not collecting the address that they go to after they leave prison, which I don't frankly think matters. But they are taking their address from before, correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, and so what we because we have the census data at these small census blocks we have looked at from the ACI records they're telling us what facility each individual person is in and so we can calculate how many people are in each of these facilities and the far right hand side is what is on the arts the ACI roster which is what we have. And so what we are seeing is actually, we're pretty close looking at the ACI information to what the Census Bureau counted in each of these facilities. 
we're only off by 28 people overall. Rather phenomenal. I mean, I was flabbergasted, actually. I, I thought we'd be off a lot more. So we, we think we've got some halfway decent data in order to work with and play with to see what has taken place and what kind of change. So that's from the ACI population and the ACI information in 2020. We also are able to take a look at um, the demographic comparison because we have the demographics from the census, number of non-Hispanic whites, non-Hispanic blacks, non-Hispanic Asians, Hispanics, all of those categorizations are in the census, and we can look at what is there in terms of race from the ACI data. Now, the ACI only does one question. What is your race? And they treat Hispanics as a race. It's slightly different than what the Census Bureau d does. But when we look at the data and look at how the Census Bureau records race and how ACI, the bottom of the screen, how they record race, they're pretty close in each of these facilities. They're a little bit off in some instances. Excuse me, Kim, Rep Phillips? Yep. Kim, you were talking about race. They have one question, race. Do they break it down the same way as we've got, been known from the other communities and that down to six multi-races, et cetera? Or is it just the major race that they might be in? Are it's, we doing things differently with the ACI um, population compared to the general population outside of the ACI? Um, it is, does not have as many distinctions as what the Census Bureau does. Okay. For example, Pacific Islander, other, those smaller groups that we have within the census, we don't see that in the ACI. Okay. But the major ones they do have. And so that's what we have here in this table to be able to compare to see whether or not is, is this a good clue of what was in ACI on April 1st, because we've got another count from the census of what was there in ACI. So on we're, April gonna, 1st. we're going to be able to get a better count as to the breakdown of multi races and that with, well, within the ACI population. The multi race is another question. You know, I've, I've spent a lot of time with you in terms of, of multi race and the increase that that's been for the 2020, um, we don't see a category for multi-race in the ACI. Okay. Okay. All right. So it's just the major uh, races is what we're dealing with in that regard. Excuse me, Kim, Rep Newberry. Thank you. Yep. Kim, you may be getting to this point, so I'm not trying to short circuit it, but I am curious because fundamentally, as I said, I, I think that we should count people where they're from if we can do it not all grouped into one city, but as a practical matter, whatever's right or wrong, do we know, can we run data and see fundamentally how much of a difference it makes? I mean, I, I'm sure that not every, there's 75 house districts. I'm sure the prison population is not split 75, you know, equally. But with the prison population we saw, was it 2000 something? Do we know how much of a practical difference this will make? Funny you should ask that question. Well, I figured you might be getting to that point, but I mean, yeah, seriously, because yeah. that, the thing Hold is, we on, can debate this philosophically, and I know there's a lot of passion on this issue and, and on both sides, because yeah. I've, I've, believe me, I've heard from people from Cranston that want to keep it the way it is. I understand right. that. Right. But I want to know, you know, does it matter? Very good question. And let me tell you a little bit, and then we can answer that question. <clears throat> um, this is one of the questions that we have to deal with in terms of trying to geocode the addresses that we have from the prisoners. And can it be geocoded? Um, there's a number of instances where they could not be. <clears throat> 271 instances out of all the prisoners where there was no permanent address. It was just blank in the record. 
there was no information. Okay, so they don't have it. We don't have it on that side. <clears throat> there was 154 inmates that were from out of state. We could see it's, you know, some other state that they're being recorded from. Um, there is also a, a recognition of a home confinement. Um, there was 146 of those where we don't really know where they go or where they are on that side. So it was not something that gave us a warm, fuzzy feeling of categorizing that. Um, we've got 44 prisoners that are serving out of state um, that are sentenced and in a prison someplace else on that side. Excuse me, Kim, Rep Kazarian. Sorry, just another quick question. Wouldn't they have to have an address if they're on home confinement? <laughs> one would, yes, one would think. Um, uh, and um, it, it is a distinction that was there within the information. And so um, we'll, we'll take a look and see what, what is really recorded there. Okay. Um, it was just part of what, what the institution was that they were assigned to on that side. Um, and in most instances, they did not have uh, an address within that record, in that, in that regard. Don't know why, but that's, yep. Um, so there was a variety of different circumstances. Um, we couldn't locate addresses in some of these when we try to put them through a geocoding system, uh, several different geocoding efforts. Um, and trying to do that. So as a result, we've got 691 of the prisoners that we have records for where we could not geocode and being able to place them back at some other address. That amounts to 26.4% of the prisoners. Okay. And the ACI has cautioned us many times about the reliability of the addresses. And so I, re, you know, again, note that factor on that place. So where could we place these? Well, we can put them in a number of instances. Um, indeed, 38% of the 1,927 records, inmate records that are geocodable, 38% go back to the city of Providence. Okay, so that's 737 people would go back into Providence. Pawtucket is 11.9% for 229 people. Woonsocket is 156 people for 8%. And all of these, you get down Cranston's 146, stays in Cranston. Um, but then you start getting down to smaller and smaller numbers on where things go to. Um, and while you've got the biggest chunk in Providence, um, there's stuff spread out throughout the state on that side. So, you know, Tiverton's got 12. Uh, on that side. There's, there's a lot of people, one in Richmond and one in West Greenwich. Um, but it's a variety of circumstances on that side of being able to geocode those and being able to peg where they might be. Excuse me, Kim. Rep Corvesi. Yes. Uh, so again, kind of dovetailing on what Representative Brian, uh, Newberry said. So you have 700 and change from Providence. Am I correct if I'm reading that correctly? Yes, 737, yes. And you're able to geocode it. When you say geocode it, down to the address? Yes. Down to the particular district, not a zip code? That's correct. Okay. Down to the particular Would you district. be able to, without breaking your disclosure, would you be able to further break it down within the cities where they would be in the districts as it would be now, let's say? As yes. opposed to before you do the line. Can you do that? Yes, we can. Have you done that? Yes. 
Will we see it? Um, in trying to get here by five o'clock, <laughs> that's the one piece that I wasn't able to do a slideshow. Okay. I do have the table here, though, for you. Okay. And I'll share that and add that to the, to the slideshow. Thank you very much. This is a well-informed committee. Doc uh, is loaded for beer. Absolutely. Thank absolutely. you, Doc. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, geocoding, yes, it's possible uh, to do some of that on that side. What is important is to recognize that these are very small numbers. And indeed, if you look at the population of the cities, the number of inmates that are being geocoded and allocated to those cities amount to a very small percent of the city on that side. Um, in Providence, it's only 0.39% of the city's, of Providence's population that would be going back into there. So while it's 737, it's not a big percent of what is there already on that side. Of course, though, I, I will say, Kim, if you're in an election and you lose by one vote, I, right? I agree. I, I agree. Just, I count the votes. Uh, I'm, I'm just voter. begging the obvious. Every vote you. counts, right? Go, go ahead. I'm just... Yep. Keep yep. going, please. Absolutely. Thank you. Doing a great job. Absolutely. Rep Newberry. I just want to touch on that point. First of all, I think a lot of these people can't vote. So it's not really about the votes, but it's about how you set the district population. So if you've got 700 and change for the city of Providence under existing districts, you know this better than I do, but there's 13 house districts, for example, that are either all or most of Providence. It's probably not equally split among the 13, but it's also not going to be all in one and not in another, right? And the range of tolerance within the percentage for this year is actually about, coincidentally, I think, but about that same number per mm -hmm. district. So we're talking about a change that's within the percentage calculation of where you can draw districts. And that goes to my question. <coughs> my, right. You understand, you understand what I'm saying? I don't know if you want to comment on that, but that's kind of what I'm getting. Even though philosophically, I think we should do this. I, yeah. yeah. Um, that is a, a factor that we've started to take a look at. Um, is indeed what you're talking about is very small numbers being put out there and making changes to, and whether or not they would, in a practical sense, have an impact. I don't have an answer for you yet, but it is a legitimate question of s dealing with small numbers. Excuse me, Kim, rep the ass. Thank you, co-chair. Mr. Brace, um, back to the information you provide to this committee um, at the beginning in reference of the um, deviation number for, per district. Is this conversation right now related to that? Uh, those districts that have a little slight of deviation, more population than before, has something to do with what we're talking right now? It, it does have a relationship to that, yes. Um, and so the, the issue is, is um, and that's what we've started to take a look at, is what is the districts right now? And if we were able to allocate that population back into the districts, how outside of deviation or stay within deviation would they be? Um, we don't have the total tables as of yet. But that is something, one of the things that we're looking at to see whether or not, as was talked about, does it make a difference on that side uh, in that regard? So um, we'll continue to investigate and try to see what's doable on this. But I wanted to give you a kind of a report on where things stand at this stage and some of the things that we've seen and have been looking at in trying to understand this issue. Excuse me, Kim Rep Diaz. Mr. Bryce, um, following the conversation about uh, numbers can be uh, still changing in terms to population, at the end of this meeting or those meetings, is any chance those uh, numbers change more, the deviation will be even greater than while we already doing it? What, what you've 
what we are seeing so far um, is that um, the biggest impact of what you end up doing on the prisoner situation is really going to impact um, two or three districts at most. And it is the two or three districts that have ACI within them. Because if you're going to take the population out of ACI and send it to Providence or to East Pawtucket or whatever the case may be, then you're going to need to redraw those districts that deal with ACI. Okay? They're going to have to get bigger because the population that you thought there were, was there has now been distributed and therefore you got to find it someplace. So it has a potential of impacting mostly those districts that have ACI within their border. Thank you. Right Repco of AC. So continuing her argument, if you will. So I see where you're saying statistically it would impact the Cranston districts the most. Correct. But in so doing, if you reallocate to Providence, because Providence was number one, and I think I read in there Cranston was number four, if I Correct. saw that correctly. Right. So when you have to expand the districts in Cranston, will you have to change the district lines of the contiguous districts that abut Cranston, or will it be within a standard deviation where you will not have to change the line? Um, good question. Um, it's a little bit too early to say one way or the other at this because, point in time. Because by changing Cranston, you may be affecting Providence. That is correct. You've you've and listened you may not, to my and, presentations and you, and de, and so many times. And yes. depending <laughs> and depending, you may not want to change Providence. Possible, sure, depending upon what, what it is. Um, I will tell you that indeed, in partly answering to Rep. Newberry's question, is that being able to allocate the population and where that population would impact which districts. As I said, I do have that, that table, um, and it doesn't really do a lot of change in a lot of places, except for those districts that have the ACI in them. Oh, thank you. Rep. Newberry. Yeah, just, I mean, it seems to me, just, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it seems to me that if we were to do this with the numbers you gave us, the impact on everything but two or three districts in Cranston or maybe Warwick on the border is negligible. The impact in those districts is not negligible immediately there, but as you always talk about the ripple effect, you may have to change those lines a little bit 15, 16, and a house may have to become pushing to 17 or 41 a little, but then that ripple effect's going to disappear pretty quickly. Right, that is correct. But those are the most impacted districts, but I'm not sure even there how much of an impact we're going to see. It's a little impact. Right, but right. Okay. right. Is that, but you, you agree with that assessment? Yes. Yeah. Yep. I mean, right. the, the bottom line and is, is that you are not going to see a lot of impact uh, with this information. It is useful information. It answers some of the questions that we've had in trying to understand. And more importantly, is it doable? You know, in talking with so many of the states, you know, they're having problems getting the information or being able to decipher it, being able to analyze it, being able to, to properly geocode, whatever the case may be. Well, we're actually in somewhat better shape than some of the other states, but because we are so small, it's not going to have as much of an impact as what you might see in other states in that regard. Excuse me, Kim Rep Diaz. Uh, Mr. Brace, sorry that I keep <laughs> poking on you, but... Uh, just to think about the impact Providence will have at the moment we continue to do the analysis of how we, we're dealing with this. As we remember, we have districts that have 
overpopulate in terms to uh, make all these trees equal in the state. So in case, it's hypothetical question, in case um, those districts that have population that oversee the numbers that are supposed to be, and those uh, state rep or senator who already had an appointment with you team to redefine the line. So that would be another situation for community uh, leaders who want to make adjustments also for a state rep and senator, right? Yes, that would be true. Yeah. Um, you know, Sorry. as I said, we do know for each Senate and House district how much of an impact at least these initial data set would be. Um, and we'll put that up on our website so that you can see that you can see the impact and which ones are impacted. Uh, we'll probably do a number of maps of, of the information on that side. I love maps, so, you know, um, but to see what what kind of potential. But you are right, in because um, I did see in, su in some districts where they were, say they were um, uh, right at 4.5% high, but by adding the populations, it's now 8% high. So yeah, we'd have to do a little bit more to bring that down on that side. Same side on the, on the negative side, you know, whether or not they, they get pulled in or out on that side. So yes, it would change some people's, um, but in most instances, it's not a lot uh, on that side except for those districts that's got ACI in them. Mr. Chairman, I think I'm finished. I'm happy to answer Wait, any more questions. I do have Certainly. Uh, thank you, Kim. Rep Kazarian. Sorry, Kim. Um, this is wonderful, by the way. It's great to see the data. Um, as a, a former urban um, planner, it's, it's just I love seeing data and I love seeing maps. So thank there you again you for providing this. Uh, I do have another question, though. Um, how does the data that we're, we were able to get from our um, ACI compared to what other states were able to get. So the other states that were able to implement this, was their data as, as um, like percentage-wise, was it as high as what we were able to get, or was it lower, or what would you say? Um, in talking with some of the other states, um, there was a number of them that had problems geocoding. Okay. Um, and some had higher non-geocodable rates than what we're seeing. Um, so there are instances, it, it varies. Um, there, there's, what, I'm, what I've been hearing from a number of different people is that um, pulling out people and being able to, to have firm numbers, it will decrease the, the counts of what we have for the group quarters of the prison, for example. Okay. Um, the other added problem, if you remember in, in talking with you also before, is the whole question on the um, uh, disclosure avoidance issue, mm -hmm. the new thing that the Census Bureau has put into play. Um, you know, that probably might have some impact uh, of the racial counts. And so that's what we were trying to get a feel for and whether or not it was in fact the prison issue or it was the disclosure avoidance issue that's mm -hmm. causing questions on, well, what percent minority is this in this particular area? Um, we were hearing initially when disclosure avoidance initially came into play, um, we were hearing reports of, particularly um, when you had a prison that had a high minority population, the blocks outside those prison walls tended to be not very heavily in minority percentages. Well, the disclosure avoidance took a lot of those minority populations and put them out into the surrounding blocks. Mm -hmm. You know, not thousands of people, 
but it did change some of the racial mix so that when you're looking at the percent minority within a prison or a census block, you suddenly have to take into account a little bit larger territory because you might have this disclosure avoidance kind of fudging up the data on that side. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Any other questions by any members of the committee for Mr. Brace at this time? Uh, Rep. Phillips. Chairman Phillips. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> As a follow-up to one of your conversations, uh, Kim, you said in 2010, when they did the census for the ACI, they included houses outside of the prison, single families and maybe multi-families, I don't know what. Were you able to back those numbers out to get, because we had, what, 3,700 and some odd people in the ACI? That's including those single family houses. Were um, you able to yes. get a better aggregate of what's inside the walls of the ACI by backing those other houses out? Um, in 2010 population numbers? Correct. No. No. Um, they were part of that census block. Right. We know from the dimensions of what that census block was, it included some of those houses on that side of the street. Um, how many that was? Um, I mean, I could look at registered voter files, for example, uh, to see you know how many registered voters were potentially put into the prison, for example, on that side. But you know. This was an anomaly of the census and census geography. If indeed you lived at one of those houses and you went in to register to vote and you had this address, well, the registrar is going to put you not in the prison. He's going to put you where that house number is. Right. It's just the quirk of what the Census Bureau is dealing with, the geography, that when they started putting dots of where the, their houses were, some of those dots were sitting over in the prison block. And so that's what we tried to correct in 2015, 2016. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Any other questions at this time? All right, thank you, Kim. If you would hang in there, because I'm sure we're going to be it were questions from the audience that uh, some of us clearly will not know the answers to, and we may need your expertise. 